didn't cover too much of what the XP-2 is all about. This helicopter is built like, uh, I guess, a Formula One car. It's built with 4130 chromoly tubing. It's built with not so much weight savings in mind, but getting strength for the weight that you're going to spend, which means if you're going to put tubing into it, brace it, weld it, make it right, diagonal it, and what happens is you have a really strong hull, and in case you get in an accident, which is something that could happen, especially with an experimental aircraft, you're well protected. And one of the reasons is that I bought this particular seat for this helicopter is that this seat's actually designed for a stock car and it has a chromoly tube frame internally in it so it's bolted to a chromoly tube frame and of course this five point harness is as well so that's going to hold me in the seat real good and it's going to provide also a head and a neck brace with this, this back piece here in case I roll upside down because in some cases the mast will actually come out of the helicopter so you want to be fully protected when you're in your seat. Now these fuel tanks, we'll hop on to this, these tanks are actually fuel bladders and they are a rubber bladder inside this two piece aluminum housing. That bladder contains a foam which is very porous so the fuel doesn't slosh around in here. And that's used on stock cars and drag cars and Formula Ones and it's a good technology to keep from getting burned. Because if you puncture the tank, the fuel's not going to vaporize as quickly, and it's also not going to come pouring out like a river. It, it, it minimizes the flow if you get in a wreck where you puncture the tank. Uh, these tanks are also equipped with rollover ball valves on top in case the machine's tipped over. The ball valves on the vents here seal the tank so that you can't push any fuel out onto the ground uh, in case the tank's not punctured. Uh, the rotor head on this system, uh, to get back from the fuel tanks to the rotor head, the rotor head, if you look up here, it's gimbaled on an automobile U-joint. And that U-joint up there is a Spicer U-joint that came out of a truck. It's actually designed for a truck. It was bought in an auto parts store. But it allows the head to teeter, and it also allows the head to swing back and forth. See how it works on its axis like that. And that's an action that all Bell 47s use, only they have their own gimbal and setup and all made up for them. So the system's very similar to a Bell 47 in the way it operates, but at the same time, it has a rotor diameter the same as a Robinson R22, which is 25 feet. And the cord width of the blade is a little bit wider. Now as far as, we'll skip to the tail rotor now, this drive shaft couples to the back of this transmission here using these Morflex couplings. And they're a fail-safe coupling because they're rubber impregnated and they use four volts. And if the rubber ever fails, you still have the steel housing here that, which captures that rubber or what's left of it to keep driving the tail rotor. And these are an off-the-shelf item. They're, you can buy them anywhere and they just last forever. In fact, this very same coupling is certified and used in the Brantley B2 and B2B helicopters and they're rated at 2,500 hours which is just outrageously long. So what I do with this here is I drive this little shaft down here to this next coupling. This allows for the tail boom to move around and shake and do all kinds of things without damaging the drive shaft here. It allows the drive shaft actually to float. And this shaft drives through these hanger bearings here 2750 RPM, it comes to this 90 degree gearbox where again we're coupled but we're using a spider coupling here. This allows the tail gearbox to expand and contract and, and move around back here without damaging the shaft. It allows it just to float. It's very critical when you're designing a helicopter. You need things to move around a little bit so they don't crack and fatigue. And on the tail rotor itself, it's very similar to the Brantley. It uses a delta hinge to pivot on and unload itself if you're in high winds. And it uses the same system for pitch control, which is two rods that work themselves over center. They actually don't go over center, but they come close to it. And that's what pushes the pitch change bearing back and forth and allows the pitch change to happen at each of the tail blades. 
And this way when you're pushing the pedal back and forth, you can see you can get feathering one way or the other via these little rods just going back and forth. And this tail rotor's turning at 2750 RPM. It's the same as the engine, same as the drive shaft. And these blades are actually made of stainless steel. It's folded over a piece of chromoly tubing and then it's uh, welded up and also we use a little bonding in there too. Tail rotor gearbox is real easy to monitor the fluid. It's like most certified helicopters. You can look right in the hole there and there's the oil. And so on your pre-flight, you know that everything's hunky-dory there because there's no leaks and the oil's in it. And let's skip over here to the horizontal stabilizer. This is something if you're building a kit helicopter, it may look neat and that's something you paint red and put on there, but it has a really vital function. This trims the helicopter, in my case, in forward flight. And in forward flight, this thing actually creates a motion that pushes the tail boom up so that I don't have to push collect, or excuse me, cyclic forward. And that in turn allows you to draw less power because you're not moving the mechanical controls up there to tilt the disc. You're instead tilting the whole helicopter, which in turn tilts the disc and it flies much smoother and much easier in a cruise. I experimented with two different sets of these, some wider, some a little longer, some with end plates on them, and I found the best for all worlds is this one here, set at this degree, which I've forgotten how many degrees down it's set, but you just have to fly it and just see how it feels. And if you take it completely off, you'll notice a difference in your forward airspeed and how you fly the helicopter. This piece here, the vertical piece, that's real important primarily if you lose a tail rotor because this is going to help streamline you in the event the tail rotor stops spinning or comes off because that's, that's the only thing you've got to save you to keep the helicopter streamlined or at least slow the amount of spin that you're going to have if the tail rotor fails. Now, as far as the landing gear goes on this helicopter, it's set up much like a Robinson helicopter setup. They use a set of tubing that goes underneath the frame and it hinges at its attach points. So this kind of acts as a shock absorber but not nearly as well as the Brantley helicopter because there's no hydraulic dampening in this. You're actually relying on metal yielding or bending a bit as you land to soften the landing. And it's not much but if you were to get into a severe uh, landing where you came down real hard, this would actually hinge here and yield in the center and the skids would fold outward and that would decrease the amount of, of speed at which you're going to actually hit the ground with the frame of the helicopter. So it kind of saves your back and it kind of saves on damage on the helicopter too. So there's just little things like that that when you're building an experimental helicopter, you want to look at them real closely. Everybody out there builds something a little bit different. They build something a little bit lighter or heavier, or they spin the blade a little faster. But you want to look at each one and find its, its good points, its values, and try to incorporate all those good points into the helicopter that you're building. Reed, spell your name. It's R-E-E-D is my first name. Last name's West, W-E-S-T. Okay.